Okay, so now let's move on to the next person. Uh, Steve, your turn. Would you like to share your presentation? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Taro, for letting me uh, have this opportunity. And uh, wanted to thank everyone who's here. I, I'm going to talk about our case study, which is feeding strategy to grow big koi. So uh, it's not the only way to feed your koi. Uh, we show koi, and part of showing koi is for them to be big, but they also have to maintain their quality. So we've done a lot of um, a lot of work here at our pond to come up with strategies that can grow them big. Um, Tony showed some excellent photos. I've got a few just sort of representative of some of the growth we've gotten. Um, I won't go over each of these individually. We made a conversion to centimeters at one point, um, and I'll talk more about measuring your koi and keeping track of that, but you can see um, that in most of these are one year from, from one year to the next. We like to take a video and a photo from one year to the next so we can see uh, how well they're growing. Uh, but these are just examples. So we definitely are trying to grow the koi big. And I understand this is not for everyone, but hopefully we'll cover some things in here that will apply even if you're not trying to get monster koi. So what we're trying to do is simulate a mud pond. We want the fish to think there's an unlimited supply of fresh water. If you think about a mud pond in Japan, there's maybe 50 fish put into a two acre pond. So it's tons of water. So how do we simulate that? We have a lot of biological filtration. We have four big, huge showers. We turn the pond water over two times an hour. And then we also um, are continually adding water. You can do this with a, with a water change or we do it with a flow through, meaning we always have water coming in. And this allows, as Tony said, this allows you to not overfeed your pond because obviously as the fish eat a lot, they develop a lot of waste. So this is what we do to simulate a mud pond with our backyard pond. It's really important to keep the conditions stable. This is, this is so important. So uh, I thought Taro did a great job of explaining how much fish can eat depending on the temperature. So uh, we heat our pond uh, to keep it warmer in the winter and we put a shade sail over it in the summertime. Even if you don't heat your pond, you can cover the pond when the water starts to get cold and it would help you stretch out that season. Even if you can only feed for another month or two by putting that over, it gives you one or two months extra of growth per year. And over time that will add up. In the summer, uh, even though the fish can eat a lot, sometimes because we know ammonia is more harmful when the water temperatures are higher, it's hard for your pond to keep up with how much you could feed. So if you can just add a little shade to the pond, help stabilize those temperatures from day to night, it's helpful. So uh, we have a well, and so what we find is what's great is the well water is warmer than the air in the winter, and it's colder than the air in the summer, so it helps stabilize. And then you really have to have stable pH and KH. Uh, if the pH is swinging, it throws the fish off, and we found they do not, they do not eat as much. They're not comfortable. I, I'm a stress eater. When I'm stressed, I eat. The koi are not stress eaters. They don't eat when they're stressed. So minimizing stress. And there's a lot we could say on that, but I, I would just say try to keep the stress down. So critters getting in your pond, uh, bad water conditions, you know, fluctuations in temperature or pH, all of those things introduce stress. We try to instill what we call an abundance mentality. So this sort of applies to humans as well. So we don't want the fish to ever feel super hungry. We don't want them to ever feel super full. So because they don't have stomachs, right? They, when they get hungry, they can't store any food for the future. So if we let them get totally full, that doesn't really help. We don't want them to be super hungry. So we feed lots of small meals and we have a small amount of food present in our pond. I would say often, if you go out in our pond at any given time, there's probably a small amount of food. Um, but we do monitor that very, very carefully to make sure it's not food waste. And then, um, a lot of people love it when they see their fish go crazy and there's a feeding frenzy. Uh, with tosai, with one-year-old fish, that's normal. But for us, if our fish are going crazy, that means they're not getting enough food. Um, if you were to go out to our pond right now, when I throw food in, they're very, very slow because they know more food will come later. There's no rush. There's no competition. And that means everybody's getting enough food. If, they're, if they look like they're starving to death, it probably means, unless they're tosai, they may not be getting enough food. 
So large koi actually need a different amount of time to eat in our experience than smaller fish. Taro uh, primarily feeds small fish and then sells them when they get to be nisai or sansai. And that's about the time when we buy our fish. Large <clears throat> koi need a lot of time to graze. And so we've found that five minutes or 10 minutes is not enough. We actually, I'm not suggesting this for everyone, but we have a 30 minute rule for our pond. So you have to find a way to deliver food that will allow grazing. So if your pond, for example, sucks all the food into your skimmer, you can do what Tony did and put hoops, you know, hula hoops in the water. Or if your bottom drain takes all the food, you can find an area, maybe that's right between two bottom drains so, so it'll stay a little longer. If you have to modify your pond design to allow more dwell time, then you may have to do that in order to get really big fish. We found that our koi have individual personalities. Um, I can go out and see where a fish is feeding and I can tell which fish it is. Um, some of our fish only like to eat on the bottom. Some only like to eat on the top. Uh, some like to eat halfway down. And so we feed a combination of floating and sinking food. Um, definitely the sinking food is a heavier, more dense, more efficient pellet, but we have some fish that just don't prefer it compared to a floating food. So we try to use a mix of floating and sinking. We use a mix of large pellets and small pellets. Some of our small fish don't mind a large pellet. Some of our large fish, for whatever reason, they like the smaller pellet. So we just try to make sure everybody has something they like. You know, I grew up in a family of seven. And so there was always plenty of options to make sure everybody got their fill. So that's kind of how it is out at our pond. And so um, that's sort of the model we, we've chosen. Uh, we also deliver food to multiple areas in the pond. This gives a chance for, you know, if the dainichi are, are hogs, the dainichi koi, then we put some food in other areas so the slower eaters can still get some. Um, again, I mentioned the ability to sort of stretch out the season, um, extend the season, find a way to keep the water a little bit warmer later in the year, keep it cooler in the summer. We don't ever fast our fish for months at a time, but we do find uh, it's very helpful to fast the fish from time to time. Um, I know in Japan they can fast them all winter, and then because they're in a mud pond, they can do they they can basically just only eat six or seven months a year when they're larger koi and they get enough. Uh, we can't feed that volume in the summer, uh, so we we try to feed a little less uh, than that at the high time, but we don't feed nothing. Um, so we, if we we do like to fast them a little bit in the winter and let the water get a little cool, um, but it's a sh much shorter interval. And we only feed our koi if they're active and hungry. We really have to watch. They're not, they don't eat the same amount of food every day. Um, so I wish they did, <laughs> but ours don't. Um, one of the things we like to do is track the progress of our koi. We find it super helpful. We measure our koi at least twice a year. We take them out of the uh, pond or we just dip a bin into the pond and then guide the net into the bin and tip the bin down so they don't actually ever have to leave the pond. We take photos and videos of them. Uh, we use an online calculator similar to what Taro has, but it has the larger sizes as well. So Taro, if you have a calculator that includes the larger size fish that you can upload, that would be helpful for, for people. Uh, and then we, we basically try to measure um, either half a percent, one percent, or one and a half percent of the weight of the fish based on the time of year. We, we have found that we have some fish that eat too much, uh, some fish that you know, need more time. So if you're showing fish, you really have to say, we're gonna to feed to the needs of whatever your best fish, best fish is. So we find ourselves doing that. So if we have a favorite koi that we're trying to prep for a koi show, that's the way we feed our pond is for that, that fish. Um, here are just some examples of some fish in our pond. These are all well over 36 inches. This one is now, uh, this one on the left is probably retired, but it's, it's uh, I measured it uh, two days ago. It's 98 centimeters, uh, seven years old. Um, and so these fish, um, they've, they've been able to grow and keep on growing uh, based on our strategy. And it's really fun to have people come over to our home and see fish so big. Again, not for everyone, growing, growing big koi isn't a requirement. I certainly had a lot of fun in the hobby when my fish were all 10 inches, but um, it's, it's really fun to have big fish. And so um, that's the approach we take. So, so thank you everyone for, for your time. And Taro, thank you for letting me share this this evening. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and uh, it was a great idea to 
take pictures of the koi, keep track of the size uh, on a regular basis. Uh, that's definitely something that I recommend to all of you so you know what, whatever you have been doing is working well or not. Okay, so, okay, now we still have some time. Let's see if we got some questions. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, what if you want to limit the size of the koi in a small pond? We are in Hawaii and do not have much room, but do we still feed five times a day? Well, this question came to me direct. So, okay, let me answer the questions. Uh, if you want, no, actually you don't have to feed five times a day. You know, if you need to feed uh, once a day, that's also okay. Well, we are in Hawaii. So basically we have the flexibility of feeding koi anytime, as long as you kind of feed about the same time every day. And if you like to feed a uh, small amount, uh, I mean, if you like to keep them small, uh, you just have to feed less. Uh, yeah, they may look hungry, but you just cannot feed a lot in your pond. And also, uh, or, you know, feed something like a mandafu, you know, that, that they will eat, but it's not gonna be converted to the meat uh, or size. So that will work. Uh, if we have to leave, okay, let's go to the next question. If we have to leave the pond, untended for a week or more, how should we feed automatic feeder or floating block? Oh, okay. Uh, if, if, if you are leaving the pond unattended. Uh, Better not to feed. Correct. I mean, don't do anything unless you have somebody who can watch, your, watch the pond. You never know, you can set up the auto feeder and let the auto feeder feed your koi, but anything could go, could go wrong. And koi, just like koi can uh, uh, can fast for the whole season of winter, uh, it's okay not to. It's okay that you don't have you, you don't feed the koi, you know, every day. Uh, they can go without the food for uh, for several weeks, no problem. Okay, so. Okay, what is the consequence of feeding below uh, 50 degrees? Okay, well, anyone, um, if you have questions, maybe you can point somebody that will help. Uh, but anyway, so, okay, I, I talk about 50 degree. Uh, the consequence of feeding below 50 degree, that means koi cannot, they eat, but they won't digest the food. So it's gonna cause some uh, internal problems. So koi, Sometimes, you know, if you don't feed right uh, during the cold season, I see those koi get sick easily in spring when the spring comes, or you may find the koi dead in spring. So that's probably what's gonna happen. Uh, next, let's go to the next question. If you feed the same quantity of floating and sinking food, why does a sinking food provide 20% better result? Maybe uh, Steve, you wanna, well, Steve or Tony, do you want to pick up this question? Yeah, so, so the, um, the floating pellet actually has, is extruded to make it float, meaning it's injected with air, right? So that it's a less dense pellet so that it floats. So if you have two pellets that are the same size, one is sinking and one is floating, it makes sense that the sinking one is more dense. That's why it sinks. <laughs> it's also a little more economical, right? Often the floating bag and the sinking bag of food cost the same, but the, the sinking bag weighs more. So um, often we see uh, uh, the sinking food, it doesn't have to be, but it's often higher in protein. So in the summer, then you can really use that sinking food to pack on the, the meat, as, as Charles says. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Okay, let's see what's the next question. Uh, do you usually have more choices on sinking food? I only see an 18 pounds bag and wasn't sure if my koi will like it. Uh, boy, I'm, okay. Uh, oh, I guess this is for my food. Uh, uh, I will, actually I do have it in five pounds and from July, uh, it will come in 11 pounds as well. So you don't have to get uh, 18 pounds of the sinking. Uh, if you don't see that on the website, you can just email us. Okay, let's see, what's the next question? I have hey, a Taro, question. I was just yes, gonna, go ahead. I'm going to just jump in and say, if you're changing up the food, one thing that we do is you can introduce, um, you know, let's say we're going to feed a different kind of food 
and we have a current floating food and we're going to introduce a different kind of floating food, we don't just switch it all over all at once. We will mix it. But if you've never fed sinking food and you're starting to feed sinking food, they won't be used to it. So this is going to sound mean, but I would recommend not feeding your fish for a week and then introduce small amounts of it. And once they start eating it, they'll like it. Um, that way they're a little more motivated. Thank you, Steve. That's a really, really good suggestion uh, coming from a real experience. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's see what's the next question. Um, how much fresh water should be sent through my pond on a constant flow for it to be healthier for koi and that allow more growth? My pond is 6,000 gallons and I have unlimited water from my drinking spring. Uh, I think, you know, Steve, do you want to pick up this question too? I think you you know, you, you, you mentioned that in your uh, presentation. Yeah, we're, we're on a well, so our water is free as well. So, if, so if, as long as the well water does not have ammonia um, or other things that need to be um, converted, in other words, if your well water is good water, then there's no reason you couldn't flow 10% uh, per day, as long as you live in a neighborhood where that's manageable. We live in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, in, on a, almost like a farm and we have a forest. And so I dug a 100 yard trench uh, and put a three inch um, pipe under the ground. And so our flow through just goes out into the forest. It, when I lived on a quarter acre neighborhood in Utah, that wouldn't have been possible. So that's probably a limiting factor for some people in how much water they can flow. But if you're on a well, you're probably in a more rural area. 10% uh, per day is my recommendation if it's free. Thank you, Steve. Yes, uh, I agree with it. Uh, my father used to tell me that, you know, the whole pond water needs to be changed uh, within uh, seven to 10 days. So which is about 10% uh, of the whole pond. So, okay, uh, next question. Uh, what amount of koi clay do you recommend? Tony, do you wanna pick up this question? This is about the koi clay. Yeah, I, uh, I personally uh, use about a cup a week in a 20,000 gallon pond. Um, you could probably use more, but it clouds, it does cloud the water a little bit. So I just use a cup a week um, uh, when, I, when I clean the filters, because I don't like it to cloud the water too much. And it has made a huge difference for luster and color and health. It's, uh, I wouldn't be without it. Thank you, Tony. Okay, so next question. This is for Steve. Uh, I use a Koi Cafe auto feeder uh, close to the lowest setting. I live in South Florida and feed 10 times a day. Water temp is 82 degree and it's always a feeding frenzy. So could it be possible I'm not feeding enough since they eat a small amount so fast every time? It's also in the chat box. Yeah, so um, it depends on the size of your fish. If you have fish that are under 24 inches, then, and especially if you have male koi, um, you're going to get some sort of a feeding frenzy, uh, even if they're eating a enough. Our fish, you know, some of them are 36 inches, but our average fish is probably, I mean, I think we have 22 fish over 30 inches. So many of them are large. And so they don't, they don't like to fight over the food, but even the smaller ones, um, they, they're, not, they're not in a frenzy. So what I would recommend doing is measure the fish, get sort of an idea of um, how much your fish, uh, based on their size, how much they weigh, and find out how much the total, total weight of your, of your fish are. I don't know if you noticed, but in Taro's calculation, his tosai, when it's warm, he feeds like four or 5% of their body weight every day for the small fish. For fish, larger fish, we, we cap it out at one and a half percent. If it's a quality food, that's high in protein, that's plenty for growth. But that's, that's the other factor, uh, Matthew, for you to look at is how, how much fish volume do you have and how big are your koi? And if you're feeding one and a half to 2% per day and you're still getting a frenzy, then don't worry about it. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. If they're small though, then feed more. Yep. Okay, thank you, Steve. Okay, so let's see, what's the next question? Uh, is waffle water from Board of Supply, uh, Water Supply healthy or co for koi? I, I believe so. Just make sure you dechlorinate the water. <clears throat> okay, so next one, this is a health question. So let's skip that. 
what is koi clay? Is there a brand of koi clay you use? Uh, Tony, do you? Uh, there's, there's, uh, it, it's getting harder and harder to get, but the, the ingredient that has to be in there is Mount clay. Make sure it contains Mount clay because that's the uh, type that's found in, in Nagata. And uh, if it doesn't contain that, I wouldn't get it. But Taro sells it when he has it. Um, is like, like I said, I use several brands. That's whatever is available, but it's got to have the Mount clay. Okay, thank you, Tony. Yes, uh, we do carry uh, koi clay from Japan. It's called uh, koi nendo. It's available on my website. So uh, uh, it's, I'm going to type it here. So if you are interested, uh, check on my website. Okay, so it looks like this will conclude the question in the chat box. And, uh, oh, and then it's perfect. It's 3 p.m. It's about just at about an hour. Okay, so I think uh, this is it for today's seminar. Uh, first of all, Tony, Steve, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your great experiences. Uh, uh, everyone, please give him a big hand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Taro. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. So Thank uh, you so uh, much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, uh, next seminar that I'm planning, uh, I'm, I, I will try to invite uh, Mr. Kawaguchi from Japan. He's a developer of the high silk. He's a specialist of the silkworm. You know, uh, we know uh, we know that silkworm is good for koi, but we really do not know why and what are uh, you know what they are really. So uh, you know, he his company is over 100 years, and he's been doing this silk and silkworm. Uh, for all his life. So uh, I try to see if I can get some of his experience shared with uh, uh, our customers here. So once everything is determined, I mean, uh, uh, nailed down, I will definitely share that information with you. Okay, so uh, definitely I'll let you know. And uh, until then, you know, please, everyone, please stay happy with your koi.